welcome. This isn't so much a talk, really. It's kind of more a personal journey for me in, in that there are, this place became hugely important to me. And I'm not going to cover every painter. I'm going to talk about various objects. Um, local connections. I work in the county. I was educated in the county. Uh, and this place is really, really important to me. So I'm just going to talk about a few things. I might miss things out. I'm going to talk about a few things that are important to me. I'm going to share some objects with you. I apologize for the quality of some of the photographs because I took them. Um, so there you go. This is a photograph of me in a cricket team in the late 60s. And if any of my friends are watching, that's the 1960s and not the 1860s. Um, and it, this might give you a kind of a hint as to one of my favourite Worcester objects of all time, really. Um, and it was about this time I was 14 and I'll, probably after a cricket match, I went on a school trip to Worcester and we, we parked up by the cathedral and we went round there and saw um, Prince John's tomb and all that sort of stuff. And then I walked down the cobbled walkway to the Dyson Perrins Porcelain Museum. And I thought, oh, this will be dull. And I met this wonderful chap called Henry Sandon. And Henry, in my eyes, has done so much to promote Worcester Porcelain as a brand, as a museum, as a history. And Henry kind of inspired me um, to get involved in it. And I would, and, and what what really sold it for me was Henry's complete and utter enthusiasm for the subject, for the people, and for everything else. And so he has a lot to answer for, you know, because he got me into this. Um, I, I had a, a, a minor diversion when I went away to university. One of the things that um, kind of struck a chord with me, one of the objects that Henry showed me was this service. And this is a Views of London painted by Harry Davis. Uh, and you look at it and you think, well, that's really nice because you've got the town, you've got London Bridge, um, you've got Nelson's Column, you've got St Paul's, you've got the River, you've got Big Ben. And then Henry said to me, you've got to realise that all of these images that are painted, they're painted on a curved surface. And if you want to paint a straight line on a curved surface, it's not a straight line. And then he said to me, you've also got to realise that all of these colours that you see now aren't the colours that they painted on there. They kind of go that colour when they're fired. And that really struck a chord with me that you were painting curved lines that ended up being straight lines and you were painting a green sky that ended up being a blue sky. And I was just amazed by all of this. And it really, really kind of just drew me in. Uh, and it eventually, um, I started working for a firm of, of local auctioneers and um, and I really enjoyed it. And this man came up regularly as a Worcestershire landscape painter, David Bates. And that might be the Malvern Hills in the background, but th there were a lot of it. He, he specialised in these sort of kind of pastoral landscapes. And David Bates' son who was also a landscape artist. His name was John Bates Knoll. Well, in fact, he was John Noel Bates, but he swapped it around to avoid confusion with his father. And you might be asking, what's all this got to do with Worcester Porcelain? But David Bates was a Worcestershire man and he painted at the Worcester factory and he specialised in painting roses. Now, I've got to be absolutely truthful with you. I, I love David Bates landscape paintings. That rose plate kind of doesn't really do it for me. But then he painted roses, not just on plates. And if you see here, this fireplace, this is painted by David Bates. I mean, for me, it's just absolutely stunning. Uh, and a lot of these people who worked at the factory, these artists, you know, they had to do this work to earn extra money. They weren't paid huge sums of money. And one of the things about them, perhaps what I'll talk about it with later artists is the humility of these people. They were all incredibly humble uh, and, and the skill that they produced, it's absolutely mind blowing. So this is in the gallery upstairs at the museum at Worcester. Um, this is a commercial break now, we are open um, 10 till 
for Thursday to Sunday. So if you haven't been around the museum, please don't listen to what I've got to say to you. Come and have a look at it. It's really, really fantastic. So there's there's the David Bates fireplace. Um, you know, and I just think it's something special. This is another man. You know, these 20th century painters, it's kind of flowers, sheep, cattle, pheasants, pigs and polar bears, if you're lucky. You know, there's a and fruit, there's a theme to all of this. This is by Ernest Barker. Ernest Barker was a, um, a pupil of Harry Davis. Um, and you can just see, in my eyes, the influence of Harry Davis in the way that these sheep are painted. Um, and I think his work is really undervalued at the moment. I love Ernest Barker's work. I think his, his um, sheep paintings are fantastic, but it wasn't just sheep that he did. Um, he also painted birds. This is a little small plate by him. Um, painted with a finch of some sort or another. But one of my favorite things that he painted was actually, um, he, he did flower paintings. And he, this is kind of typical of his flower work, almost unique to Ernie Barker in my eyes, in that his, his work was almost in the, in, the, um, in the style of the Dutch old masters. And these still life studies of flower paintings I, I just think they're absolutely fantastic and I really, really enjoy them. And these aren't in my top three. I'm going to tell you who my top three artists are later on. But I, I think this is something that I'd love to own. Um, the next work I want to show you is by a lady called Kitty Blake. Um, she must have been a staggering lady working at the factory back in the day because she always had a cigarette hanging from her lips. That wouldn't pass muster in today's health and safety conscious world. Um, and I actually, I often wondered if she used one of the pots as an ashtray. Um, but she always painted blackberries and autumn leaves. And I think many other painters painted, you know, you've seen that Barker did birds and sheep and flowers. I, I, I'm not sure that I've seen Kitty Blake's signature on anything other than autumn uh, leaves and blackberries, unless, of course, it was a special watercolour. And next up, we've got this is an example of a watercolour by Kitty Blake um, that was painted for Hawkins retirement book. Um, when, when artists retired at the factory, they were given a book and various other artists, they would put a sketch, almost like an autograph book with their signature in it. And this is absolutely delightful from Hawkins retirement book. But one of the joys of being a local auctioneer for me is two weeks ago in my sale room, I, I'm standing there and this chap came in um, and he said to me, I've got these um, little watercolours that I'd like to sell. So um, he, he showed me this, this sort of, this was the first of them. And you've got these kind of seagulls and the ducks and, and the ark and the lighthouse. And it didn't look overly special, really. And, and then he pulled the other one out of his bag. And, uh, and there it is with the fox and the dog and the ducks and the monkeys and all sorts going on. And again, it didn't look kind of overly special until you see the signature, K Blake, Kitty Blake. And I, I, I like, I don't know exactly how old this gentleman was, but I think he was in his mid eighties. And Kitty Blake had painted this for him um, when he was six, year old, six years old. His parents had got this work done specifically as a Christmas present for him to hang in the bedroom. So, you know, I often think as a work of art, it probably isn't worth a great deal of money, but with a signature on it, it really does add, um, add to it. And I think that's just a lovely, lovely thing. Um, I think that Daisy Ray was a, a, another artist who painted flowers at the, at the Worcester Foot Factory. And one of the things I love about this is I started working for, for a firm um, in Malvern, J.G. Lear and Son, uh, back, uh, back in the day. And one of the secretaries there her relative was Daisy Ray, and she was incredibly proud of the fact that her relative painted at the factory. And you know, you go through Worcester and you speak to relatives today of people who painted at the factory, and they are all hugely proud of that connection. And, and for me, that's absolutely lovely. Um, another man that um, crops up fairly regularly at auction is J.H. Lewis. Um, and this is perhaps his take on Stinton. He was fairly prolific. He produced watercolours. 
um, and uh, oil paintings in, in very similar sort of kind of landscape scenes um, and, and was also a, a pop painter. Um, the, the next piece I'd like to show you is, is by Millie Hunt. Um, and, and she was one of a number of roses, rose painters. Another was Spilsbury, Edith Spilsbury, she, uh, and, and her, um, I think it was her granddaughter, um, lived in the same village as me, and the family have collected works by Spilsbury through the years. And, and that's just another, for me, it's a really lovely connection. Um, when I started this talk, I said to you that I was going to choose perhaps three standout artists. And for me, the next chap is one of my top three, C.H.C. Baldwin, Charlie Baldwin. And, you know, you don't need a signature on a pot to see that that's by Charlie Baldwin, that rich powder blue, um, the fantastically gilded rushes, and then these magnificent um, swans that are flighting. And it, it was really interesting because I started working in Worcester in 1976. And I was, uh, and you know, when you're a lad fresh out of college and you've got to learn to value these things, um, it's a lot harder than it looks. Uh, but I was told quite clearly that the only way to value a Charlie Baldwin vase was it was a thousand pound a swan. So it had five swans on it, it was 5,000 pounds. And if it was three swans, it, had, it was worth 3,000 pounds. And it's something that is always stuck with me. But again, Charlie Baldwin, um, one of his relatives lived in Pershaw, hugely proud of his, of his forebearers work. And it wasn't just on pots. Um, I mean, these people were, they didn't earn huge sums of money and they had to paint other things to make a living. This is a little Charlie Baldwin watercolor of rabbits. Um, I can tell you that while swans are worth a thousand pounds a bird, rabbits are worth 250 pounds each because I, I sold this about a year or so ago for I think a thousand pounds but it's just an example a really lovely example uh, of his work and I always wonder whether he just painted these off spec to try and sell them to someone or whether that this was actually a commission um, that was perhaps for a child's Christmas or whatever um, but he wasn't just swans and he wasn't just birds i think this is a fantastic piece of painting this is a landscape by charlie baldwin um, if you look at the reflection in the and the panel on the right you can almost see the war the, the the buildings and the trees are reflected in the water um it, i just think it's really really glorious uh and he is one of my top uh, three artists. Um, we'll decide who's going to be the best at the end of this. But, it, you know, perhaps the highest compliment that anybody can pay anyone is to have their work reproduced. And latterly, Charlie Baldwin's work was reproduced by the factory um, in a series of limited edition vases. And, and this is a pair of swan vases. Now, it, it, I hate to be critical because I couldn't even begin to draw a straight line anywhere. But for my eyes, the powder blue isn't quite right. I'm not sure that the setting sun is quite right. And I'm not sure that swans are quite right. It's still a fantastic piece in its own right, but it is nonetheless, it, it's a tribute to Charlie Baldwin. And, and I mean, his work I think is absolutely fantastic. And today when I go and unwrap a box with the Charlie Baldwin vase in it, I still get hugely excited. Um, the next piece is William Hawkins. Um, I, I was called out to a house back end of last year and, um, and they were relatives of the Hawkins family. And this is a plaque that we sold. Um, and if you look really, really closely, I talked about the, color, the quality of photographs earlier. And if you look really, really closely at that, you can actually see my hands, the camera, and the face in the top half of the photograph. So for that, I apologize. I hope it doesn't devalue the kittens too much. Um, this wasn't a Worcester porcelain plaque. Um, it was a private commission. It had a companion um, painting of, of puppies, um, but I suspect it may have been an unmarked piece of porcelain that came out of the factory. Um, I just think it's really, really, you know, it's a lovely piece of work and it's so, appealing in the subject matter and at the end of the day it's it's kind of the subject matter that's that, that, that sells these things 
Um, the next image is uh, is Hawkins' retirement photograph. And I, I mean, <clears throat> if ever you wanted a photograph of the greats of English pop painters, this is it. You know, because on there, uh, we've got Lockyer, Shook, Price, Austin, Bill B, Harry Ayrton, Powell, Freeman, Barker, Rushton Townsend, Harry Davis, the Stintons. I mean, they're worthy of a, of a photograph in their own right, really. Kitty Blake, Seabright and Ricketts. And, you know, that for me is kind of the golden age of, of Worcester pop painting. Um, the next slide is, um, in a way, this is kind of a follower of David Bates, Albert Gingell, not Gingell, but Gingell, hard G. He was um, a Worcester porcelain artist back end of the 19th century. And his views of Worcester crop up fairly frequently. And this is the River Teen, um, a poet roughly just between midway between Worcester and Malvern. And um, it's just a, a lovely image, really, a really lovely image. Um, if we go on to the Stinton family, now you could argue that they should be in my top three. Well, I'm, I'm sorry they aren't, um, because I think that if I had to choose one of them, it would be a little bit invidious, uh, and, as, and I can't choose a family of eight of them. Um, there was John Senior, Annie, Arthur, Harry, Walter, James, Henry and Kate. Um, their dynasty started in 1805 and it went through to 1963. Um, and they did many, 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 many different subjects or similar subjects. But this is Harry's stag vase. And, and, and if you're going to collect Stinton, this is probably up there as the ultimate piece to collect. Um, it, it's, it's not really my taste, but I can fully appreciate the quality. Think back earlier to what I said about Harry Davis's London vase scene, that you're painting an animal on a curved ginger jar in colours that are totally alien to what it's going to end up looking like. And then you can appreciate the calibre of this. Um, this next piece is a, a landscape plate um, by Harry Stinton. And, and I love the fact that th I love these images and I often wonder whether, you know, they, got, they didn't go to Scotland. They didn't go to many places that they painted. And I wonder where if this is an amalgam of an imaginary Scottish castle. And then on the left hand side, you might have the the Y meandering through some Worcestershire countryside. So you've got a kind of a composite picture <coughs> of, um, of uh, you know, what the English or British countryside might look like. But I, I love this plate and I love the gilding on it. Um, if we move on to the next piece, probably the most I think these are fantastic, absolutely fabulous. They are, if you get a, um, you can get a Stinton vase and the painting is, it can be mean sometimes. If you look at these vases, they were quite big. But the painting is really fulsome. It occupies the whole of the front panel of the vase and it kind of hits you in the face. It, it, you know, th there's no doubt that that's a really strong, um, highland scene with cattle watering and and it's just you know the, the thing that really so sold these vases to me is the fact that uh you know it, it's that it's just so full and such a strong image uh, and if you move on um you know you're going to be commercial about these things as well and if you want to sell something um at the top end of the market who do you go to well you're going to sell for or, or aspirins you know and, and what do they what do they want? Well, they want something high end uh, that you're not going to find um, in any old shop. And you produce a dressing table shop, uh, set and you have it hallmarked and you have a, a really good leather case and you have all these Worcester porcelain hand painted plaques put in there uh, and then you sell it. And <clears throat> I've seen individual pieces like this, but the only piece the only complete set that I've ever seen is here in the museum. I think it's fantastic. And but just to show you how it can look. So if you look at either the brushes or the mirror in the back, if you go on to the next slide, you can just see this is a, a James Stinton plaque of, of uh, probably it's probably off a, um, a dressing table brush or something like that. 
and it's been framed up to to, to represent a class, <clears throat> to represent a, a, a plaque. So I, you know, I just think that's. Uh, I often wonder whether someone, if this was a spare plaque at the factory got, that got made into a plaque, whether it was never fitted into a dressing table set, or whether someone broke a brush or something and it and converted it to this. Either way, I think it's lovely. Um, this is um, James Stinton's work. He was the pheasant painter. That by and large, Harry did cattle and, and James did pheasants. And, um, you know, you can almost, if you've walked through a Worcestershire wood and you, you hear the, the flurry of, of, of pheasant's wings flighting as they take off when your dog walks in front of them, you can see these two birds in the distance. And, and that's pretty much just what they look like. Um, and I think that's great. Um, they do say that imitation, I think, is the, the best form of flattery in a way. So if you look at the next vase, you would think from a distance that this is by um, James Stinton, but it isn't. It's by Leighton Mabry. And Leighton Mabry was obviously a hugely competent artist, um, not quite up there in the price structure that James Stinton is, but they, it, it, it kind of tells a story because Leighton Mabry, Brian Lehman, um, Ray Paul at Claremont, um, Bill Nichols at Albany, um, Gerald Delaney, all these people, all these artists worked at the Worcester Porcelain Factory and they left to set up, <coughs> excuse me, they left to set up their own factories. And sadly, I think their work was first class, but the telling thing about everything is that people want the Worcester Porcelain Backstamp. Um, for me, this is just the most, this is just thrown up the most interesting thing for me. This is a, a, a fruit plant by Octa Copson, painted in 1880. And I want you to look at it for a few minutes. I'm not going to say anything after. I, I want you to look at the, the damsons or the plums. I want you to look at the leaves. And I want you to look at the mossy background. Now, just have a look at that just for a minute and just remember it. Okay, that's a piece of porcelain by Octa Copson. Remember it. On we go. This is a, an oil painting by a man called Oliver Clare, and it's painted roughly the same time. And I think if you look at the plums of the damsons and you look at the leaves and you look at the mossy background, you know, I often wonder whether Octa Copson was Oliver Clare. In fact, I know he wasn't because Oliver Clare came for a family of Birmingham painters, George Clare, Oliver Clare and Vincent Clare. And Oliver Clare painted fruit on a mossy background. Uh, and Octa Copson, I think is a, he, he's just, he is the granddaddy of Worcester painted fruit. So, you know, it all started here. And, you know, whether it be Evesham ware or whether it be um, painted fruit or whatever, Octa Copson was the start point of it. Um, and there's a little plate by um, Hale, I think it is, William Hale. And I mean, fruit is just hugely popular today. Um, that's a cup and saucer by him. And you can almost pick that pair up and, and chew on it. This is by Horace Price. Um, and my mother was, was, was really impressed because a relative of hers knew Horace Price. And that's the thing, you know, if people have these connections to these artists in Worcester, you... You're really proud that you knew these people and it was something special. I didn't mention it earlier, but I did a talk many, 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 many years ago and I was talking about the Stintons and um, this lady stood up and she said, you better be very careful what you say. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, why is that? She said, because he was my grandfather and they were, they were an ironmonger's um, shop just down towards the cricket ground in Worcester. I, I, I love all that stuff. Um, the next vase or... Um, is by Bill B. Um, and and I, I love, this is just great. This is economies of scale. It's expensive to paint a whole vase. It's a lot cheaper to get somebody to paint a small panel on it and then glaze the rest in this kind of uh, mottle blue ground. Um, another fruit painter who um, I enjoy is Jack Freeman. Um, and along with Ayrton, Harry Ayrton, um, they painted fruit. This is actually, I think, 
Raglan Castle, which is a fruit plate, uh, sorry, which is a plate painted by Harry Ayrton, which, you know, you look at these people and to be able to paint a fantastic piece of fruit one day and then a Raglan Castle plate the next is, is kind of just unreal to me. Um, and, and in the latter day, um, this is a miniature painted fruit set. And, and I was remarking to Sophie earlier that you don't often see Kitty Blake's works kind of reproduced anywhere. But if you look at this carefully, you can see the blackberries that are just adorning each piece. And I wonder if Peter Platt, who painted this, whether he has taken some inspiration from Kitty Blake and adorned his pieces with standard painted fruit that he's dropped in his little tribute to Kitty in a way. Um, this is the next piece is a crown top potpourri. Um, so you take the top off and there's an inner cover and, and you fill it with potpourri. And when you want your room to smell lovely, you take off the inner cover and the scent comes through the um, through the holes in the cover. These vases or potpourris, they're either painted half round or completely round. And this is a completely round painted um, vase uh, by, um, I think, uh, Brian Lehman. Um, but it's just, you know, I, I, I think it's it's a really good looking thing. Uh, Ted Townsend was another artist. There we are, cut and sourced by him. Um, I think probably, I mean, he also painted birds as well. And we've got an example of his, I think there we are, uh, painted with, I'm never quite sure those are robins or bullfinches, but they're certainly birds. You can't argue with that. Um, and, and, you know, Ted Townsend could almost turn his hand to anything. I've also seen cattle plaques by him. Um, I think probably at this time, the best two fruit painters were Chivers, F.H. Chivers. Uh, and have a look at this part. This, this, this isn't actually, the painting on this is fantastic. This pot isn't that <coughs> um, spectacular um, in that it's got a blushed ivory ground. It would have been so much better if it had been painted all the way around um, with fruit. But I want you to try and remember that shape if you can, because it might just re reappear later on. So Chivers, his son Don Chivers, um, I used to meet him down at the county ground, watch a bit of cricket, and he ran a travel agency in Worcester. And he, again, hugely proud of th the work that his father had done. Excuse me. It is water, this. Um, I've already said to you that Charlie Baldwin was one of my kind of <clears throat> top ones. Uh, three I'm going to give you <clears throat> as you can you can think who they might who, who, who might be the best of the three. The second one is Richard Seabright. Um, th this is an example of his work, and I just think you know he could paint fruit like nobody else could. Um, you could pick that up and eat it. Um, he after the World War after World War Two. He was paid two pound twenty five a week, you know, and he I mean, he's an elegant looking man, isn't he? And you can just see um, the way that, you know, that sort of presence, you know, he, he, he most definitely would have achieved something in his life. Um, and the next piece is just a it's a Royal Worcester porcelain plaque. And I just put this in there. If you're going to buy a porcelain plaque <coughs> and it's all framed up, just be very, very careful. That isn't it, it isn't actually a plate that someone has broken the outside of and then they've reframed it to make it look like a plaque. Um, but Seabright's plaques really are something special. Um, there were many families who worked at, um, at Worcester. You know, you, you kind of got dynasties and you got the Austin brothers, you got Reg and Walter Austin. Um, this is a watercolour by Reg. Um, and the next piece um, is by Walter. Um, lovely claret jug on the left hand side on some gilded ivory um, and the fruit on the right hand side. Um, it, interestingly enough that he, he also worked for Rack Straws, which is a local furniture firm, and uh, he used to paint bureau covers for them. Um, and I think that's brilliant. I love that. And it was about this time, I think, that the Worcester factory were trying to get into the Australian market. Um, and if we look now, We've got, uh, well, I hope we've got, there we go. 
um, this is flowers, Australian flowers, um, painted specifically for <clears throat> for the Australian market. And, and th nowadays, the demand and price for an Australian flowers cup and saucer compared to an English cup and saucer, there's no comparison. The Australian <coughs> pieces, um, they're hugely, hugely collectible and, uh, and, and prices priced accordingly. Um, and if we look at the next slide, this again is appeals to the um, Australian market. This is by George Johnson. But what's really interesting about this is that this is not just a painting, but the, the figure is actually in relief. It stands proud from the plate and then it's painted in and painted over. Um, another artist to move on to, the oh, back end of last year, family bought this in. Um, a relative of hers was a chap called George Johnson. And these were all his designs, birds, flowers, all sorts of different scenes, uh, which we split up into about 10 different lots. But if you look, what I want you to do is look at the birds that are painted here and then have a look at the, um, at the next piece or pieces. And I think you can see that the, the brushwork for the birds um, is very, very similar. Um, I, I think he's a good artist, George Johnson. Um, his work in my book, I mean, if that, if that service on the left was by, St by James Stinton, it would be worth so much more than it is by George Johnson. But I suppose, you know, that's all down to market demand, really. Um, there were a number of pals who worked at the Worcester Porcelain Factory. There was W.E. Powell, who everybody thought, I'm, I'm going to be um, thankful to John Sandler for this information, but... It was W.E. Powell, who everybody thinks worked at the porcelain factory, but he didn't. But he was a Worcestershire artist. Then there was Walter Powell, who painted scenes such as this, um, cranes, storks, whatever. And then Willie Powell, who painted little rustic jugs and thimbles, whatever. But if we go on to the next one, this is George, um, George Evans, G.H. Evans. And he painted the, the, the plate on the right, which is very much in the Coro style. Uh, and again, some of his work can be confused with Harry Davis. Um, and then on the plate, we've got on the left hand side, sorry, we've got Soulgrave Manor. Um, but but I, I, I love his Coro work. I think it's really, really good. Um, and as I say, I think the highest compliment you can pay any artist to be sometimes confused with Harry Davis. Um, the next scene, and again, we go back to our traditional fruit and, and um, roses. This is Walter Sedgley. Uh, in a way, it, it's funny, isn't it? It, it, it? You can have a vase and it might have roses on it and be worth X. And it's got fruit on it and it's worth Y. And it's still by the same artist. And it's just simply the subject matter that dictates what the price is. Um, the, the next plate, I absolutely love this. Um, damaged, unfortunately. But this is um, a Mediterranean scene or Italian garden, again by Sedgley um and it, they're so light and they're so vibrant and here's another man painting a scene that i would he would never ever have seen so you know i think that's um i, I really enjoy those and i get excited when they come into the sale room um raymond rushton here's a man Th this is out of um a, some a, 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 a retirement book um and i think he must have done about four or five different views of this particular garden and for a time i owned a watercolor that had the same wall in it, the same flower border in it, and the same lawn in it. Uh, and Rushton was a, this is actually a sketch um, by Raymond Rushton from Hawkins' retirement book. Um, and uh, I mean, he produced lots of flower paintings, bluebell woods and that sort of thing. Um, but he also produced a number of um, grander scenes. And this one is Windsor Castle. You can just see the signature on the top right hand side, which is lovely. Um, and it's a royal palace. And isn't it fantastic? Look at the cover. You've got the crown and the ermine. And, you know, all of that reflects the royal palace. Um, and, and he did a number of palaces and views. Um, the next scene is Hampton Court Palace. And you can see the signature on the left hand side, Raymond Rushton. Um, just as a bit of a tip, if you're going to collect Worcester or any, any pot for that matter, just try and these things have a habit of crazing the glaze can craze please try hard just to make sure that the scene is nice and crisp and clean 
and that you don't get any glaze, clay, sorry, glaze crazing at all. Um, now, so I've given you Charlie Baldwin and I've given you Richard Seabright, and this is my third nomination for the best three painters at Worcester. Um, this is Harry Davis. Um, you can see here um, the Dorothy Doughty birds, which he painted the colour standard of. And he also painted the, co the um, colour standard for um, Queen Elizabeth or Princess Elizabeth on Tommy in 1953 on the occasion of her coronation. And he was awarded the British Empire Medal. Um, and he undertook kind of special commissions. Just have a, before we go on to the next slide, have a look at the little vase on the, or the urn on the left hand side. Just see if you can remember that. Um, OK, we'll move on to the next slide. I think this is really, really interesting. Um, this belongs to a friend of mine. Um, and he tells me that this vase was originally intended for Winston Churchill on a visit to Worcester. But apparently Churchill never came. And if we move on to the next slide, you can see that it was um, it, it was eventually his family or the lodge, one of the Masonic lodges in Worcester, bought this lodge to give to a member of his family. Um, and I just find it really fascinating that it's kind of, you know, that um, Worcester had been brilliant. This was designed for one person who was coming to Worcester. He never made it, so they flogged the vase to somebody else. You know, and I wonder if he ever knew that he got a church or hand-me-down, but I'd be quite happy with that, particularly if you just look at the painting. Now, this is another Serral photograph, so I apologise profusely. The flashes that you can see on the um, on the riverbank to the, the near to us and on the far riverbank are actually off my mobile phone because I couldn't get the cabinet door open. So apologies for that, but what that does show you is just the most amazing painting of the cathedral. And if you just look to the left of the cathedral um, is the bishop's house. And of course, that was the house that appeared on, I can't remember, it was five, 10 or 20 pound notes not that long ago. Um, but I just think that is the most amazing painting. Um, and as I say, this was intended for Churchill. And while we're on the subject of Churchill, if we turn the next page, we've got the Churchill urn. Um, and it always makes me laugh that somebody once told me that this is one of three unique urns. And I never worked out how you can have three unique urns, but um, apparently there are three versions of this. Uh, the one was gifted to Churchill, um, and that's in Chartwell. Another version um, was painted that was actually stolen. So I don't know where that is. And this is the third version that now resides in a private collection. Um, and there's the design for the reverse. And now if we go on to the next slide, if you remember the Chivers vase, I said to remember the shape of it, that was the blushed ivory one with the fruit on it. This is a, I, I just, this is just me. It's a great bit of Worcester, this. It's a great bit of Worcester because I love it as a piece of Worcester, but I also love what it stands for. So this was the, uh, this was a cup that painted with sheep by Harry Davis. And if you look at the reverse of it, um, it was awarded for the Corporation Sports Day in Worcester in 1911. And the thing that kind of makes me laugh a little bit is that there were first prize, second prize, and third prize. And first prize was painted by Harry Davis. Fantastic. And the second prize was painted by Seabright. Fantastic. But the third prize is painted by Ernie Phillips. I mean, I think you'd be a bit fed up, really, wouldn't you? If you were asked to paint a vase, but actually we're only giving yours as third prize because we got Seabright and Harry Davis to do the other two. That For me, that's a bit of an unfair competition, really. Um, if we move on, this is another... There we go. This is just an, a most, the most amazing Harry Davis vase. Um, if you look at that cottage scene, you look at the gilding, that wonderful apple green ground, I mean, for me, that just talks to you. If you want to own a vase and only one, then that surely is the one to own. You've got the figure on the bank there. I just think it's a really, really, um, it's a glorious thing. Uh, and this next plaque that's coming up, I, I, I love this because most of Harry Davis's work is signed Harry Davis. Sorry, he's signed H. Davis. Occasionally, 
some of his printed wares were signed Sivad, which is Davis backwards, because he didn't think too much to them and he didn't want them associated with his name. But this plaque is, is one of the few that I've seen that's actually signed Harry Davis as opposed to H Davis. Um, if we go on to the next one, um, this is a, um, a vase that was gifted to Henry Hawker for 50 years service. And I think it's the only one, only known piece of, um, of Worcester porcelain that presented to an employee as a mark of his service. And Harry Davis painted the, um, the landscape view. And again, I just think it's absolutely stunning. Another view of the city, you can see the cathedral, Mulvern Hills in the background. Um, you can see the Glover's Needle. Um, boy, do I wish I could paint like that. Um, the next piece that I want to move on to is, this is, it's not so much the scene that I love this for, it's the connection behind it. Um, there was a very famous cricketer called Ranjit Singhji, who um, played cricket for Cambridge University, Sussex, and for England. And he was an incredibly uh, beyond imagination, wealthy Indian prince. And he commissioned Harry Davis to paint two services for him. And the one service um, was painted with his gardens in England. And the other service was painted with his gardens in India. Now, so clearly Harry went down to Sussex to, to do the gardens in England, but for India, um, I don't think the factory could afford to ship him out to India. So he actually um, did the Indian subjects from photographs. Um, now, I started off, I showed you a cricket picture with me on it, and, and I've given you Richard Seabright, Charlie Baldwin, and Harry Davis as my kind of three top dogs at the porcelain factory, for want of a better word. Well, the next piece will show you who the winner is for me, because this is, I just think this is just the most amazing thing. This is a Harry Davis plaque. Um, at the county ground in Worcester, you've got the cathedral in the background. There's a little bit of artist license there because just beyond the boundary of the cathedral, there's the River Seven. If you're familiar to, with Worcester, that's obvious. If you don't know Worcester, it might not seem that obvious from that painting. But this is this is a Royal Worcester porcelain plaque um, painted by Harry Davis, and you can't read that what it says clearly um, due to my dodgy photography. Uh, apologies. Um, but in 1925, this part was given to the wife of a man called Fred Root. And Fred Root took just over 200 wickets for Worcestershire. For the cricket, cricketers amongst you, he took them at 17.5 um, per wicket, which is a really pretty good average. And this was, was presented to Mrs. Root by admirers of her husband's bowling. I mean, I just think that's fantastic. So... It's crunch time. Who do I think is, who's my all-time winner? Well, it's a bit invidious, really, to pick anybody out of all of these, but with my cricket in connection and the fact that I think Harry Davis is just the best, um, if I could own one piece of porcelain, it would be this Harry Davis plaque. And for me, he's just the most amazing painter. So there we go. That's been my journey. It's been very, very personal. Uh, thank you for putting up with me.